Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot. I'm head of research here at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We are going to hear from American Future Fuel CEO, David Suda. And during today's webinar, he will provide a, a, an overview and outlook, and then we'll take some questions. You can chat your questions in the chat box at any time. Sorry, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. We'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, first we need to discuss the fine print. During this American Future Fuel webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I direct listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on pages two of the corporate presentation. That can be found on the company's website, AmericanFutureFuel.com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this web webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider this particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on American Future Fuel. So it is quite an exciting time for uranium and uranium equities. Uranium prices have over doubled since the beginning of last year, particularly since the, the demand and supply imbalance was emphasized by the World Nuclear Association last September. And prices had, at least the earlier this week, hit another 15-year high, up to 107 bucks. They're about 106 bucks a pound um, right now. The U.S. government has thrown its support behind nuclear power and the nuclear fuel cycle. They will be acquiring and funding the creation of a Halilu fuel. And the Russian uranium import ban is working its way through Washington as well. So there's been unanticipated uranium production challenges coming out of Kazakhstan and Saskatchewan that are also adding further to the supply demand gap. So with that said, why don't I turn it over the floor to David to speak about American Future Fuel. David, thank you very much to you and to Red Cloud for hosting. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here in front of the audience um, and, uh, of course, to be on, uh, on air with another David. So um, I, I, I'd like to thank you for making, um, you know, setting the stage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, uranium uh, market backdrop. Obviously, um, you know, we're, we're thrilled to be in this sector um, it's an exciting sector, and um, I, I'm going to spare the viewers, uh, you know, my market views, um, other than to say that I echo uh, your sentiments, and, and also to uh, say that um, I have had the opportunity of, um, of being in Washington and witnessing firsthand uh, the bipartisan support uh, in, in Washington for um, what, you know, Ultimately, uh, is likely to become uh, the, the the Russia the Russian uranium ban, and um, you know I think that sets the stage for uh, what is really going to um, amplify the um, the importance of having an, an asset in the United States. Uh, there's already a, you know a, a, a supply demand imbalance, but on top of that, the situation in the United States is is going to um, make things very exciting. And with that, American Future Fuel Corporation is a company that is focused on um, exploring and, and, and developing, uh, acquiring uranium assets in the U.S. So as uh, David pointed out, uh, there are some forward-looking statements that I'm going to make. Um, Thankfully, he uh, he's drawn attention this uh, to this for me and um, formally, and I can say that uh, I make forward-looking statements because I'm really looking forward to uh, what this company uh, is going to bring uh, by way of value to investors. So, uh, what is American Future Fuel, and um, you know what what is it made of, and what does it offer investors? Uh, it offers exposure to um, a significant historical resource of pounds in the ground, uh, uranium. We're, we're not out looking, <laughs> searching. Um, we, we currently have um, a huge part of our valuation underpinned by pounds in the ground. And those pounds are in uh, New Mexico at the, at the Sevilleta Uranium Project. 
We've got 100% interest in that. It's in the Grants Mineral Belt of New Mexico, which is a prolific past producing uh, region. <coughs> Pardon me. And I will, um, I will walk you through uh, where that is and why it's important. Uh, we call ourselves um, advanced stage exploration, uh, but again, we've got uh, an almost 19 million pound historical resource estimate that we're currently in the process of adding pounds to, as well as converting to a current 43101. The share structure is, um, we've got uh, just under 100 million shares outstanding. We just completed a financing um, that was actually read, uh, led by Red Cloud. Uh, thank you, David uh, and team. And um, in, in doing that, uh, we've um, bolstered our treasury to fund our goals uh, for our conversion drilling for the next year. And it, we also added to uh, key uh, institutional investors as well as um, a, a further retail following. Uh, we have Encore Energy as a 12% as a uh, shareholder and uh, management uh, and, and insiders own about 2% of the company. We've got a relative valuation that is cheap. I just leave it at that. I often get asked, uh, you know, what's your share price going to? Um, my answer is higher. Why? Because we have quality pounds in the ground. Uh, we're in the process of converting those to a um, 43101. And if you look at uh, some of the assets um, of some of the other companies on this list and other companies that are not on this list, um, the average person can take a look at pounds and start to compare and contrast. Uh, I'm not um, here to speak for the assets of the other companies, just to say that uh, on a relative valuation basis, there's lots of room for us to grow. Our team is uh, small at this time. It's, it started as a small company. The share structure is tight. We're, we haven't you know, um, raised piles of money for no reason. And uh, by the same token, we're not out to spend it uh, frivolously. The most important thing I can tell you is that we're building a, a very strong team. Uh, we've uh, got Michael Henriksen, who is uh, one of our directors, and um, he is uh, an accomplished uh, global structural geologist in the past for Newmont, um, and has uh, since that time uh, made several discoveries for other companies. Uh, he's a strong team builder. He's uh, He's just a, a great addition to our board and, and we'll continue to uh, cornerstone that as we grow. Recently, uh, if you look at our news full, you'll also see that we added a, a very strong advisory board member and a gentleman named John Indahl, who um, was the head of the, the Uranium Producers of America uh, and um, is an instrumental figure in the uh, landscape uh, of um, uranium in the US. So uh, David touched on the, the bull market that's underway. I, I mean, I think uh, if you're an investor watching this and you're inter interested in uranium, uh, you can flip through the slides in our deck. And um, there are other companies that do a, a, an excellent job of uh, giving, providing a backdrop. But um, needless to say, we're highly bullish on uranium. And certainly in addition to that, even more so on uh, uranium in the US. So let's get down to brass tacks. I think investors want to know when they buy a share in a company, in particular, a, a smaller resource focused company, you know, what's the risk? Well, usually the risk is that you don't find something. Um, we've all been involved in the past or we've watched projects where there's an opportunity to um, invest money, to, to provide resources for companies to go and find things. Uh, and it's, you know, with, with a variety of different levels of, of knowledge, um, technical understanding, and, and then ultimately risk that those um, resources will be found. Well, in this case, we're in the Grants Mineral Belt. So that's a huge step up. We're not out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we're we're wondering if there's going to be uranium. This is an area that in those blue boxes, just west of Albuquerque in New Mexico. So if you look at the inset, you know you're in the Southwest US. This area produced nearly 40% of the 
of all the production in the U.S. So 347 million pounds is the number that we have listed here in our presentation and, and a total endowment for the district of six, you know, over 650 million pounds. This area is no slouch and it's not a huge area. Uh, as you can see, it, it only takes up a, a small portion of um, New Mexico, just west of Albuquerque. It's just off the highway. Um, you know, you could literally take an Uber from, from downtown Albuquerque to uh, the drill pads that we had set up for our, our recently completed phase one uh, drill program. So uh, excited to be where we are, uh, not just because it is a prolific past producer, but also because of the, the ease of getting there and the infrastructure that surrounds us. And as I switch to the next uh, slide here, I want to draw your attention to the fact that we're right here at the Sebayeta project and we are adjacent to or right next to, and you'll see that on the next slide, 100 million pounds of production from the Paguati and Jack Pile mines. So you, you hear the old mining adage, oh, well, where's the best to, you know, find a mine? Well, probably, you know, in the, in the shadow of the head frame of another mine. Um, that, that really um, pays here because our project is literally uh, less than two kilometers from where 100 million pounds were mined. And on the property that is inside of this um, square-ish polygon is our property. It's about, it's about 6,000 acres, just under. And, and that's what contains um, the existing historical resource, the potential to add to it, and I'll walk you through that uh, on a coming slide. But the reason we have this here is to show 100 million pounds of production, historical. This close in the same geology, well, why didn't they mine? Why didn't that continue? Why didn't they, why didn't they mine 100 million pounds here? Well, because it was on private property and, and the operators of these mines didn't have access. So um, lots of work was done. There were, in fact, several small mining operations uh, on our property in the past, and we can touch on that as we go here. But what I really want to demonstrate is that we're in the right place next to a lot of production, and then we've already got demonstrated resources on the property, and thereby we also feel that there's lots of potential to grow. So this is a slide that when we put it together, I just wanted to say one thing, and it appears here in bold. It's not exploration. We're, we're in a bucket with companies that are literally going to go out and explore for uranium. Um, we're going to explore for additional pounds of uranium, and, and again, because of what happen next to us, we feel like we should have success, but we're leveraging a historical resource of close to 19 million pounds. And what's that made up of? Well, it's made up of 3,500 historical drill holes that amount to about 300,000 meters of drilling. So I asked our, our technical team uh, to give me a, a rough estimate on what that would cost to do today and how long it would take. And, and the number I got was $75 million US. Our market cap's like 25. Canadian. So what investors have the opportunity to do here is leverage all this work that was done. Now, in a recent round of marketing um, in Europe, where I was face-to-face uh, -face with um, higher net worth individuals, some, some of them asked me, well, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good, right? Because maybe they spent $75 million of, of you know, those days money on, um, not finding anything. I said, well, that's not right because we're, we're leveraging all of that drilling to tell you that we have the data that makes up a historical resource of 18.9 million pounds. And in order to bring that to a current 43101, what we have to do is work with a, a qualified um, third party that can say, yes, in fact, all of this data does amount to what we could call a current 43101. So we've been asked to go out and drill two to three phases, um, each consisting of approximately 25 holes. We just completed the first one and it was a huge success um, in terms of matching the historical holes that we were trying to twin to give that third party the confidence that in fact, all of this work was worthwhile. And again, based on the results of phase one. 
we feel very strongly that we're going to continue to have solid success here and we're going to advance uh, efficiently both uh, from a capital perspective and a time perspective in addition to the resource that comes from the the this um ellipse in the northern part of the property there's also um a separate piece which ultimately becomes a huge uh, growth lever for us and this is from an area called saint anthony which was previously mined uh, it was it was mined um, by two in two places uh, one small underground operation but then also by open pit um, which is a great uh, reference point for us because it um, it tells us that the mineralization is amenable that way and you know ultimately these two are are, are somewhat contiguous and, and we can get into the details but these were operated separately by separate companies in the past and that's why um, there are two separate resources we are acquiring data and working through the data on St. Anthony and for us that's obviously going to be a huge growth lever um, and is going to be a, a large catalyst um, as we are able to news release that in the coming weeks or months. So why is this again going back to the valuation slide at the beginning why do I think as we shed light on this and as we as we um, introduce the the investing community and other companies to our property why do we think these are good pounds well because they're shallow right this is simply what this slide is here to show um, if you look at the elevations you've got um, sort of the bottom of of the mineralization um, which hosted this this uh, this particular unit that hosted uh, the 100 million pounds of Jack Powell Pivati, as well as um, the deposit that we're currently uh, drilling to confirm a 43101, it's anywhere between say 150 and 300 feet um, below surface. In some places, maybe a little more, but but largely um, in this stratigraphy, what you're looking at with some pretty significant callouts. You know, 0.659 percent over over 18 feet is is a is a really nice uh, intersection, and again, it's very close to surface, and there's not a lot um, uh, to strip on the top of it. So that's why we're showing you this. Um, we we want you to know that uh, these pounds are above the water table, and of course, uh, I'm gonna come back to this at the end when I make conclusions, but I haven't really talked too much yet about the fact that we're on private land and why that's important, but that's gonna be really the punchline and the crux of the story. If 18.9 million pounds of historical resource that we're well on our way to converting to a, to a current 43101, plus the potential of pounds uh, delivered the same way that the original historical resource for the northern part of the property was brought at St. Anthony's. If those things are boring, uh, then we've got another opportunity here. You know, some people love to see, you know, a true discovery made by the drill bit. So uh, in our phase two and phase three drilling, we're going to take the opportunity to drill through what is the Sebayeta, uh Paguati and Jack Pile deposit. Uh, that's, that's, really here in the in the jack pile sandstone and that's the um, the depth that I just showed you on a, on a slide previous but beneath that in the stratigraphy there's um, there is a, uh, a unit called the, the Westwater Canyon member I'm sorry for the interruption there um, in the Grants Mineral District so in those blue boxes that I showed you uh, this rock unit was host to 400 million pounds of uh, of uranium, and it's only 100 meters below. So all we have to do is let the drill turn, uh, and, and, and we have to drill through what we're twinning to see if we can, um, what we hit here in the, the Westwater Canyon member. So that's sort of the, the blue sky piece of the story. It's already known that elsewhere on the property, um, this particular unit's been intersected at, at Piedra Lumbre. So, uh, you know, as we drill, expect news on this as well. So what's coming? Well, phase one completed, the news is out. The results were very impressive. 
Uh, in fact, in some in some holes, uh, the holes we were twinning, we were able to drill almost identical resort re results. And so now we're working with uh, our QP to establish, you know, just exactly how many holes and where we'll drill for phase two. I expect them to be approximately 25 to 26 holes. And we'll have the news coming out um, outlining that phase two drill program very shortly as well. We expect to be drilling um, at the end of Q1 with results coming out through the summer. Phase three, phase three is really about doing multiple things. Um, again, you're gonna see us twinning holes. You're gonna see us looking to grow that resource a bit by drilling the edges. And we're also, you know, at the same time, uh, working on additional permitting. Ultimately, um, investors are asking us, you know, when, when are you guys gonna be looking to um, permit a mine here? Well, that's all has to start you know, we, we have to start looking at our baseline studies. We have to start looking at um, what what permitting a mine looks like because we're advancing very quickly on the resource. And of course, phase four, we call it phase four, but it's happening in, in uh, lockstep with what we're doing right now is working with the data, uh, most significantly with the data um, from St. Anthony. So we're, we're obviously very excited to tell the market what we see there and what the potential is. So these are the results uh, from phase one. Uh, I'll just draw attention to the first hole and, and give investors a simple, uh, very simple understanding of why we're so excited. Uh, in order for our QP to, to have comfort that all that historical data is, is valid, um, our results have to match the historical data when we drill. And it's not so much about, you know, beating the grades or, or uh, you know, we, we love to beat the grades, uh, but really what, what we need for um, the confirmation is is to match. And so if you look at the, the first hole, historical hole, um, RLB83 uh, historical. The depth of the hole that was, um, was drilled was 70 meters, 70.3 meters. Uh, we drilled 70.5 meters. That's easy to do. You should be able to, to drill the same depth. The thickness of the mineralization uh, was 4.7 meters. And in our case, it was 5.1 meters, very close, 47, 40 centimeters difference, uh, and then to the good. And then of course, uh, on grade, uh, the, the grades uh, matched extremely well. Uh, in fact, uh, we, were, we were slightly to the good. So what I'd like to really, where I'd like to close out, and we can get into the, the details of the, the results um, perhaps in questions, if anybody has, or, or with David, but I just want to—I want to end on why we really are um, setting ourselves apart from many of our peers, uh, and and that's this is a, a very important point. We're on private land; we have a lease from the Sabayeta Land Grant. Um, therefore, you know, uh, in the news, in 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 resource extraction in general in the United States. Um, politics have played on uh, the federal government to um, ban mining in certain areas. Um, there are cultural uh, concerns in certain areas, and um, there, are, there are national forests, monuments, a variety of different uh, sensitivities, groundwater, um, drinking water. And so this particular property has the fundamental advantage of being on private land. This, this puts us out of reach of a lot of those problems. Um, there are uh, no cultural conflicts here. Uh, we don't uh, adjoin or abut, um, for example, uh, Navajo land, and we're above the water table. So uh, again, that, that shallow nature of the deposit that I showed, um, that's above the water table, which is a huge deal uh, in New Mexico. And so we intend to leverage all of this uh, by getting out now. This is the, the first time that uh, I've actually done a webinar in North America on this company. Uh, we've done very limited marketing. Uh, we, we did targeted marketing when we um, did our uh, most recent raise with Red Cloud. And so now uh, we're out here spreading the news, showing everybody why we think we can make that big move in valuation. And with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, thank you all for your time and your attention. And I uh, would uh, 
hand it back over to David uh, to field any questions. Great, thank you very much, David. Uh, great presentation. Um, yeah, it sees, you've left the room, but I see you still here, so all, all's good. <laughs> so, Me, I've left the room? Yeah, it, that just popped up, but I think all's good. I think all's good. So. Was there was there a moment there where you where you lost me? Yeah, just just a brief moment. It was maybe lasted five seven seconds. So I don't think anybody uh, disappeared on you. So we're all good. So okay, thank why you. Why don't we hit the the question and answer here? You know, we we uh, reminded everybody online you could type your questions into the chat box at any time and we'll get to as many as we can. So we already have some questions here. Um, I guess, you know, American Future Fuels, relatively new company. Can you tell us how the firm really came to be? And I guess how you acquired the flagship asset, you know, is, and, and I guess what's your relationship with Encore? Thanks, that's a, a great question and it prompts me well so that, um... I, I sort of missed that, I guess, in, 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 the, in the structure slide. The, the quality of the asset, you know, we have, we have Encore to thank for that uh, in a large way. Uh, a couple of years ago, when we did not have a $100 um, a pound uranium price, uh, a group out of Vancouver was um, very keen to uh, join the first movers, uh, you know, uh, of which there are several, who amassed um, very impressive um, packages of, of property and also of data. Uh, Encore was one of them. And um, the, the group out of Vancouver decided to um, approach Encore and to uh, take the property and um, effectively put it into um, a public vehicle at the time. So uh, with that, uh, there was um, a, a cash component uh, which was relatively small, but um, of course, Encore uh, at the time uh, already well into uh, their plans to um, focus on on ISR. Um, they they offered up this property uh, largely for shares, and that's how uh, they ended up with a. a when I joined the company, they had a fourteen and a half percent stake, and uh, now in the most recent financing. Um, they're down to 12%, but um, we're, we're aligned with them. We want to create value for them. Uh, it, it's, it's a relatively large shareholding, and uh, we look forward to, to working with Encore in the future. Okay. And you did mention the uh, recent equity raise. Do you have any in institutional followers that joined at that time? We have two groups, um, both, I, I would say, uh, uranium-focused uh, institutions, um, both uh, under 10%, under 9.9%. So um, coming from uh, institutional uh, equity capital markets, I, I, I rarely use um, funds names unless I've expressly asked for their uh, consent to do so, and I haven't in this case. But um, I think if uh, investors do their job and ask the right questions, um, they can probably figure out that uh, these are uh, highly strategic shareholders that have come into the company and um, who we look forward to uh, to growing the company with and, and to strategically uh, building it with. Right. Okay. Now, the assets that uh, are in and around your project are largely, uh, you know, largely open pits or underground mines. Do you focus specifically on these conventional type assets or would you also consider ISR potential? I think that um, some of the other uh, early movers, uh, you know, I'll just name a, a couple of them, um, you know, uh, Encore, uh, UEC, Energy Fuels, those groups have, have done a good job. Um, you know, they're, they're actually, most of them are going into production again in ISR. So with the $100 a pound uranium, we're really excited to, to give investors the opportunity uh, to leverage that price with conventional. You know, we've got the big pounds. I think um, I've been using the corollary of, you know, what happens sometimes, in, for example, in the copper market. Uh, if you start to see a run up in the copper price, um, it's some of the smaller, really high grade projects that will attract uh, investors attention that there's uh, lower risk, high IRRs for sure. Um, but not as much leverage, right, uh, or scale. 
And so um, now that the landscape has, has changed to, you know, a, a position where we feel like we can really leverage that conventional approach, our focus will be um, for now uh, on, on the conventional side. Yeah, and I think you're in the right spot. You know, maybe could you add a little bit more color on the context of the history of the uranium industry in New Mexico? You know, I think this this Grants Mining District has been of national significant significance in the U.S. You know, this was a big uranium camp. Uh, the biggest. I mean, we're smack next to literally the 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 most prolific producing mine in the U.S. of uranium, a hundred million pounds. I mean, 100 million pounds at $100 US a pound. That's that's a lot of value, you know. That that was that was extracted um, in today's dollars there. So I, I look I look at this as a massive opportunity. Um, w- you know, we feel that we have being where we are, we can give con- investors confidence that this is a, an area that has still uh, a lot of uranium left. Um, that shows in our historical resource. We hope that will show in the pounds that we add to the to the to the docket. And then, you know, also the fact that in the past um, this area was mined, and you know the the methods that were mined uh, have been tested on our property. So, um, you know, as we as we carry forward and move uh, towards doing the kinds of studies that we need to actually, you know, accurately speak about. Um, the economics and so on and so forth we've already got a pretty decent look at you know what's been done uh, what's feasible and and what to do next so we're really excited about our position there and we we hope that we can use this asset now you know as a as a cornerstone to pursuing more like it right okay and now private land, this was off limits to some past producers and hence your opportunity now, obviously. But, uh, you know, the Sebolita project, are all the claims on private land? And does this provide both surface rights and mineral rights for it? So, yes, the, our entire um, property package is on private land. And the um, focus of our lease is primarily mineral rights. In, in New Mexico, um, mineral rights give um, companies the, the uh, certain rights to the surface as well. Um, so obviously that's, that's um, long precedented with uh, hundreds of millions of pounds that have been produced. Um, but, uh, but certainly being on private land is the key. Like we're absolutely thrilled to be on private land because it simplifies um, uh, a lot, even when it, you know, when it comes to surface rights. Okay. And the company has about 20 million pounds of historical resources right now with potential upside in the north part of the property. So what, what sort of exploration target do you have? And I guess I apologize now for using the word exploration because this is brownfields, you know, like you, like you said, it'd be more apt to, you know, how large a mineral inventory do you think you can uh, provide? Well, I mean, we've um, we're, our confidence is high to the extent that one of the the slide titles um, alludes to our target, right? We, we think that without having to look for the pounds, uh, we can get to 25. So um, tells you what we think we might have um, at St. Anthony, and what we might be able to add um, with the drill bit around the edges of the resource. Now, uh, I, I'd say that a bulk of that comes from what we think we can add from, from St. Anthony when we, when we, you know, piece together what ultimately, or model what ultimately will, will start as a historical resource there as well, that we'll then have to go and convert the same way we're doing with the northern portion or, or as Ohio as we call it. So, um, you know, some growth by drill bit and then, and then some uh, again, by uh, working with that data, acquiring all of it and working with it to to get to that sort of number that we've we've thrown out there. Mm-hmm. And how much drilling do you have planned for phases one, two, three? You know, where where are you now in those? And I guess at what point do you announce an updated resource? Good question. So phase one was uh, twenty six holes. 
And as I said, uh, we've had a news release out. Uh, investors can go to our website, pull that up, and see why we're so excited and why it was such a huge success. Uh, to the extent that it was uh, such a success, we think we may, in, in fact, be able to, um, you know, uh, abbreviate. Certainly, we, we haven't, our, 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 our qualified person is not going to ask us to drill more holes now. So our plan was to drill 25, 25, and, and maybe let's say another 25 in phase three. But, um, you know, phase one went so well that we're, we're confident that in phase two with another 26 holes and then, then perhaps another bit of work in phase three, um, we'll get to a 43-101 uh, relatively, relatively quickly. Uh, we would love to be able to tell the market that um, we're going to do this uh, inside of 18 months, I, I've been using 18 months as a target um, to having a 43101 in hand. And uh, if we continue to have success, then you know we, we'd love to stay conservative with our outside goalposts and then um, deliver something that's uh, inside of it. So uh, you know, under promise and over deliver will be our, our strategy here. And this isn't antelope pasture. You, this area has been drilled quite a bit. How many, how many holes out, are there out there? And I guess because your phase one drilling was so very closely matched to pre-existing holes in the results, do you think you can use a lot of that for a, a, a lot of that historical drilling for your existing re, for your upcoming resource? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Three thousand five hundred holes on that northern portion of the property. Okay, so that makes up 300,000 meters of drilling. And uh, as I said uh, earlier today, to do that again um, would cost, you know, as much as $75 million US. So um, in order to use that information or a bulk of that information, like the, let's say we're gonna drill 100 holes. And that's, I, I think that's safe to say, that's probably at the high end of our plans to convert the existing historical resource to a uh, valid and, and new 43101. Um, that's a very small percentage. 100 uh, is, as, as a percentage of 3,500 is very small. Uh, so, you know, I think we're already, we're already winning there. Um, we're now going to obviously go and um, drill another 26 holes in phase two so that's that's what the market has to look forward to are they going to be as successful in in phase one as they were in phase two in order to um, allow that third party uh, qualified person to give us our certificate so to speak that that historical resource that all those holes are um, the data is valid to be used in in a model for for coming up with that number so it's uh again it's a really rare opportunity there's there's very few if any other um companies out there that ha are in a position like we are um especially at the market cap and valuation that we're at okay so we, we'd expect news coming from the company on a fairly regular basis going forward very regular basis um not just from our exploration plans uh, or permitting and some of the other, um, you know, call it technical advances, but um, also corporately, you know, we're, we're building this company, we're bolstering our bench strength, um, both, both with uh, human resources and, and, and again, always looking for opportunities to add assets of value to this using, you know, using the value of this to, to build. Okay. So adding assets, do you think those would be in New Mexico as well or similar type deposits? Well, the, the uranium world, especially conventional in Colorado Plateau, um, isn't, it's not vast. Uh, so, you know, the, the opportunities are in New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Utah, Wyoming, Texas, really, uh, you know, we're, we're in a group of, of companies now that are all looking for assets. You know, the, the, the price of uranium right now is driving the market to invest and, and not everybody has what we have. So, uh, you know, having, accepting the fact that some of the first movers out there um, had done a really good job of picking up a lot of the assets and are, 
are now in a position to, to be going into production. We're going to have to be aggressive, but we're, we're going to look for quality. We're not just going to put up pounds um, for the sake of putting up pounds and, and then asking investors to figure out, uh, you know, what's, what's good and what's not good. Uh, we are, we're starting out with the best, so we want to continue to do that. Uh, so we'll be judicious, but we'll be aggressive. Okay. So, and, and I guess proximity to a mill is also an important consideration out there. You know, it what, is, it uh, is. If I was going to look just, to, I guess I didn't, I didn't answer your question directly and let me do that, David. The, our, um, our goal is to uh, de-risk the company. So if, if somebody says to me, well, you know, when's the last time a mine was built in New Mexico? Well, not, not in a while. Is it the best uh, I get all, I ask I get asked this all the time. Well, there was all this mining there um, before. Is this the best jurisdiction for permitting uh, in the U.S.? Uh, people will tell me it's not. So uh, what do I do? Well, I, I want to go out and diversify um, our opportunities. So looking at, for example, um, potentially properties that are that don't have as many pounds, let's say, um, but they're closer to a mill. Or you know they're 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 closer to production and they're closer to a mill, so those are obviously things that we'll look look to do um, and look to add. Uh, you know, diversifying uh, away risk um, is is always something that I think every company should do. Uh, so we'll be you know we'll be keen to be working with with some of the other um, companies, our peers. It's an interest. It's very different than, for example, the gold space, where there's so many companies. The the management teams of the various companies rarely know. They they rarely see each other or talk to each other, let alone even know each other. Sometimes, um, the uranium industry is pretty tight, and there's a lot of different um, opportunities. So um, you know the the horse trading, so to speak, that can go on. Uh, something that's, for example, could be core to us and non core to somebody else is um, it, those are the kinds of discussions where you find effectively you find value and synergies between companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We do see that elsewhere, you know, companies de-risk, uh, you know, we we're looking at some of your peers that want to mine in Colorado, a process in Utah, mine in Oregon, process in Nevada. So that, that's something that, that comes up uh, time and time again. So, uh, okay. Just, uh, you know, how much cash do you have on hand now? And can that get you through your resource estimate or what, when might you need to come back to market to fund additional work? Well, the idea of raising um, almost three and a half with you guys just before Christmas there, you know, a pretty tough time. We did that at a, at a tough price, um, but we, we bit the bullet for two reasons. One, we wanted to make sure that we could fund ourselves for the whole year and, and get through phase two so that, you know, our geologists could hit the ground running with, checks in hand to pay drillers and, and, and permitters, et cetera. Um, you know, as well, we brought in two really key institutional shareholders. Um, so we've got, um, you know, somewhere around, around $4 million, I think in our treasury, but the last reported numbers, uh, are always best seen in the deck. Uh, I, I always guide investors to to look at our deck to see our published numbers. Yeah, you you never know when these financing windows open and close. So, uh, you know, tough market before Christmas, but uh, you know, uranium price took off. I think you should have very happy shareholders once you put this uh, this uh, money to work. So, uh, last question here before we uh, wrap things up: uh, What's your end game? You know, your your ultimate objective? Or are you wanting to just expand and delineate the resource and then once you get that are you looking to sell it to a larger developer or producer go in production yourself what's what's the end game the end game is really to create as much value as we can for shareholders by you know being judicious with our capital by um you know handling what we know is a premier asset you know it's it's we know it's 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 one of the best it, it, if you talk to our geologist who's had experience all over the Colorado plateau and, you know, he'll say it's the best. So, uh, our, our end game is, has to start with, you know, treating that asset with white gloves, 
bringing it along, advancing it in the best possible way, making it attractive to every company in the space that wants a conventional uh, quality asset on private land, and then also leveraging that to grow the company. You know, we, we want to grow this company, and we need to build a team that can, you know, either um, operate or sell. I think any time management walks around and says, oh, I just want to get the resource and then we're going to sell it, I mean, you're, you're already a seller before, you even, before you're even done adding the value. So for, for myself as a shareholder and, and representing um, the shareholders that I've brought in and that I intend to bring in, uh, I'll tell them that you know, our job is to create as much value for them as possible. And then um, you know, whether we build something uh, or sell something, uh, will be determined by what brings the most value to shareholders. That's my philosophy. I think it's important people know that. Okay, great. Well said. Well, David Suda from American Future Fuel, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. And uh, sorry for the glitch there. I don't really know what happened. The screen went blank and I just pressed some button that said reload. <laughs> Minor glitches to compare to what we've had in the past. No, no worries there. So with that, that said, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Our next webinar is coming tomorrow. That's Wednesday, February 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern, when I'm going to sit down with uranium producer UR Energy. And a reminder, the Red Clouds pre-PDAC conference is approaching. That's February 29th and March 1st. We expect close to 100 speakers over this two-day event, a live event in Toronto. Uh, including American Future Fuel and 27 other uranium companies. So, uh, you know, David mentioned the uranium industry was a tight-knit group. A lot of them, if not most of them, are going to be there. So uh, have a great day, everyone, and thanks for supporting Red Cloud's webinar series.